Philippians chapter number 2. I'm going to read two verses. Verse number 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, be ye like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, I don't, I don't know if we've ever talked about these verses. I know we've referenced to these verses, be of you know, one accord, of one mind. But we're not going to be teaching on that this morning. But we've got to read that in order to glean the thought. So if you will, stick with me. He says, verse number 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's the goal. Okay, that's the end result that the Apostle Paul says, by the will of God, that should be what we aspire to be as a called out, local, visible, New Testament church. Right? That we should be of one mind, we'd be like-minded. Okay, and one accord, no divisions. Right? We know that without unity there is no unction. Right? But then he also says, being of the same love. Having the same love. Right, well, what's that? That's the love of the Father. Right, that's the love before we got saved. We didn't know anything about it. But now that we've experienced His love through the presence of the Spirit, right, and dwelling in us, we felt it, you know, under conviction before we got saved. He loved us so much that Christ suffered that much for our no good, dirty, rotten, filthy sins because He loved us so much He didn't want to see us die and go to hell. Right, that self-sacrificing, unabashed, going to tell you the truth because you need it, not because you deserve it. Right, and then show that love to others. It's the kind of love that you can't show until you know. But after that we've received or experienced the love of God, we can show that love to others. Fruits of the Spirit. Love. Very first one. Don't even have to go down the list. Right, if he's in you, that love will come out. But see, there's the love of God. Then there's the love of the world. We've still got that carnal man. There's the love of man. Right, there are still people that, you know, men pleasers, they're gainsayers, they're hirelings. Right, they care more about the people and what the people think about them rather than about the people. They love the acclaim of man. There's the love of money, which the Bible tells you is the root of all evil. Money's not evil, but it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Right? Money's the money. In fact, money man made. God didn't make money. Money has no real... The only reason that, you, that your money has value is because you think that it does. It's true. I mean, even before, you know, nowadays where dollars traded on the stock market... Right before that, money was valuable because for every dollar that they printed, this isn't the case anymore, but for every single dollar bill that they printed, there was gold to back it up. So the reason that the paper was valuable is because you could, I mean, I've seen them, they used to have like little red seals around the circles on the dollar bills. You could take it into the bank and you could get that much gold for that dollar bill. You could trade it in. Right? But why was the gold valuable? Because people thought it was pretty. Really? Can't make hardly anything out of it. It's too soft. Right? But yet people thought that it was valuable. Right? It's the love of things more than really just the love of money. Some people got a love for things that aren't this, but it's the love of things that really have no eternal value. Right? I've got news for you. Jesus used the illustration that, you know, all of our works when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to pass through the judgment of God, and we know that our God is a consuming fire. So as we bring those deeds to Him, His presence is going to get away, you know, get rid of all the wood, hay, and stubble. And then He says, all that's going to be left, gold, silver, precious gems. That was an illustration that we could understand. Fire hurts wood, doesn't hurt gold. You've got to get it really hot to hurt gold, silver, and precious gems. Right, but I got news for you. When he burns this world up with a fervent heat, all the gold's gone. I don't know where God got the gold that he's making them streets of gold out of, but he didn't get it from here because those are going to last. 
But he's, there's so many things that people attribute value to that they love that aren't worth anything. He says, don't have that kind of love. That's temporal love, selfish love, it's vain love. He says, the love of God is for the betterment of others, not for yourself. And he says, that's the kind of love that should be found at the house of God. That wasn't anywhere in my notes, but you're welcome. Don't know how we got on that tangent. But what I want to look at, verse number one, and not, long time no see, buddy. Right? If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. He's saying, as long as these things remain, we can do verse number two. He says, without verse number one, verse number two, not possible. He says, if there be these things, then, verse number two, fulfill ye my joy and be these things. He's saying verse number one is the prerequisite to verse number two. You cannot be like-minded. You cannot have the same love. You cannot dwell together in unity. Right? How sweet it is when the brethren dwell in unity. Pleasant it is. It's a beautiful thing. Why? Because in the carnal man, I don't want to get along with you. Carnal man thinks that I'm better than you. Carnal man thinks that you've got faults and I, I don't. But the spiritual man, because we know these things in verse number one, we can dwell together, be of in one accord, like-minded, right? of the same love. Well, how do we do that? Because the things in verse number one are supernatural things that bind us together through the cord of the Holy Spirit. Look with me. It says, if there be any consolation in Christ. In other words, if there's any you know, to find that word consolation. Right, nowadays, they use it as a consolation prize. Well, you, you're guaranteed to get something. No, 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 that's not what consolation means. Consolation means that there is inherent good. There's profit. What does inherent mean? That it's just part of the package. Right? For instance, when you bought your house, if you own a house, or when you bought your condo, or when you rented your apartment, after you put the down payment down, they didn't tear all the carpet up, take all the paint off of the walls, and then walk out with it. That was part of what just came with the deal. Right? Well, what's the consolation? He's saying, if there be therefore any consolation, if there's still any value in Christ, is what he's saying. Right? There are days that you think, well, I know that he promised to give me life and life more abundant, but today's a hard day. Right? He's saying there's going to be days that it feels like I don't, I don't, the flesh is going to be saying this, not the spiritual man. But the flesh is going to be saying, I don't know why we ever decided to be a Christian. It's the hardest thing we've ever done. Well, yeah, because anything worth doing is worth doing right. And he said that the world would hate us because they hated him. He promised that temptation would come, but it didn't come from him. And in every temptation, he makes a way of escape. And he doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able so he says even though those things come they're not stronger than you because I won't allow it to be he says they cannot overcome you unless you let them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world but on them hard days that's where you start finding out the true riches of Christ right? somebody just gets saved all they know is that they're not going to hell and they love it hallelujah I'm still happy that I'm not going to hell but when he says any consolation, that's when you start finding out about that lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, that he's got the balm of Gilead, that he is sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for us. God prays to God for us. The Father listens to the Son as the Son prays for us. Right? That he said that if he go to prepare a place for us, he will come again and receive us unto himself. That where he is, we may be also that he's preparing a place that there will never ever be separation again. That he promised that the hardness in our life is not due to necessarily us. It's not due to him. What's it due to? Sin and the curse. But when we start thinking about the consolation of Christ 
everything that we got in addition to what we really wanted. Right? Well, when you wanted the house, you got the yard with it, hopefully. Hopefully you didn't buy a house and somebody else owns your yard. Right? Well, you say, well, that's a lot of yard work. Yeah, but ladies like flowers. I don't know why, but they like flowers. And you can dress up around that. There's a lot of consolation in that. But see, in Christ, we have so much more than what we realized we got when we were saved. Even, because half of it hadn't been written, you can't understand it all. But even if you did know every single word on every single page of your Bible and understood the spiritual implications of each one of those words, you still don't understand Christ. Because we've got all of eternity to figure out. I mean, my little pea brain, even if you could understand all of this, right? He's the Alpha and Omega. He's beyond our comfort. We wouldn't know about God unless God told us about Himself, which is what He did. So then, even if you did understand everything that was in here, there's still consolation in Christ because He's so much more than you could ever understand. What are you saying? It's good knowing Jesus. That's what He's boiling it down to. If Jesus is still Jesus, that's how He starts the sentence off. And he says, if any comfort of love. He says, if there are still those that through love... He didn't say that there's going to be a lot of them. He didn't even promise it would be the love of man. It may just be the comfort knowing that God still loves you. But he says, if love hasn't lost its effect, is what he's saying. Right? Love is what drew us out of hell. Love is what drew us to God. Because he drew us with cords of love. Right? Love is what the house of God is supposed to, it's supposed to be known as the house of praise, but you're also supposed to find love at the house of God. But right? it would be, we'd be known as his disciples because we have love one for another. Right? As long as love hasn't lost its effect. I know in the last days that there'd be, you know, a losing of natural affection. But God's love's just as powerful today as it ever was. Why? Because that love can't be affected by earthly things. Because it comes from, So in other words, they say, if the salt hadn't lost its savor, which it never will, they says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, we'll come back to that in a second, it says, if any bowels and mercies, what's that? Well, that's an old-timey way of saying that if there's still, you know, your bowels were first, we think of intestines, what it meant is your organs. He's saying if people still, for the cause of Christ, are pouring out their hearts to help other people, if there are still mercies that are bountiful, not just God's mercies, but every now and then God asks us to be merciful. But to prove that we do believe what we say we believe because we live it. He says, as long as there's a remnant that still cares more about others than they do about themselves, that even though God doesn't ask them to, they give you know a tithe and an offering, and then most of the time throughout the week, if they find out somebody's got a need, they're just being merciful. They find out that somebody needs a friend. They're there as a shoulder to lean on. They're there to help bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. He's saying as long as there are still some that are willing to take up their cross and follow after Him, embrace hardness so that others can know the goodness of God. Then He says, in verse number 2, Fulfill ye my joy, be ye like-minded. He says as long as there are still some dwell together in unity and fulfill not only the Apostle Paul's joy, because that's what he, he desired for the church to be that at Philippi. Well, why did he desire for the church to be like that? Because that's how God told him the church should be. And he said nothing would make him happier than to know that they were fulfilling the will of God. And truly dwelling together in unity. Not just in word, right? Not just occasionally, but day in and day out. Right? But one of those things in verse number 1 he says as long as you still have this you can do verse number 2 what was that if any fellowship of the spirit 
Now, I don't know about your Bible. In my Bible, that's a capital S. Right? That's not talking about between our spirits, Brother Tommy. Right? In our spirits, you and I can talk a whole lot about Star Wars. Right? We get along on that, like, but we start getting on different topics. may not be fellowship anymore. Right? If we, in the flesh, I know a lot of y'all, car people. You can sit and talk about cars. Right? But then politics come up, and that may be a different story. Right? Or what you think about this person or that person or opinions that you have on this, that, and the other. That's not fellowship of God's spirit. That's fellowship of man's spirit. And it doesn't say that this is fellowship between our spirits and the church. Right? He's not saying just as long as you can come together and fellowship with one another. Right? That you can come, because let's be honest, a lot of things that call themselves churches nowadays are just social clubs. They come together, they listen to music, they stand up and jump around for a little bit, and then they go home. Right down at Crossroads, I don't see how that's any different than going to the movies. Everybody comes in, they get coffee, donuts, snacks, whatever they want, they go sit down, watch something on the screen, and then go home. Right then, there are some places that it's just a ritual. Right, they come because they feel obligated to, but they got to make the service last about, I don't know, 30 minutes. Because afterwards, people still want to hang out for an hour and then still be able to make it to the restaurant on time. They're not there for the fellowship of the Spirit. They're there for fellowship with man. We've already talked about the love of man. Love of man's approval. Right? But the truth is, everybody just wants to feel a part of something. That's why them jokes... They call themselves churches. Used to, they called themselves fellowships. Didn't have a problem with that because that's all they were doing was fellowshipping. Right? Got a problem when they called it church because Jesus didn't start that. But, he says, fellowship of the Spirit. What's that talking about? If it's not talking about, because well, he doesn't start talking about what happens in the church until verse number two. Verse number one are things that happen outside of the church right so he says fellowship of the spirit what's, what's that he's saying as long as there's fellowship with the Holy Spirit not collectively personally he's saying as long as the Holy Ghost is still communicating still doing his work then you can have all these things in verse number 2. Because if we're honest, the Spirit's the one that does everything in verse number 2 and draws men together through the love of God to fulfill the will of God. Right? It takes a supernatural act to do something that man cannot do. I cannot knit people together. I can't fitly frame them together. I can't attach us to the body with Christ as the head. You know who does that? Holy Spirit. But see, the Holy Spirit doesn't fellowship with the church collectively, like, you know, there isn't a pillar of fire that comes down anymore or a pillar of cloud that comes down anymore where the will of God is known for us to follow after it. Right? That would be a collective fellowship with the church. Now, every now and then, he walks through here and sits down among us. But he doesn't speak with an audible voice. How does he move individually? He speaks to you. Right? Doesn't speak to me and tell you what you need. No, He speaks directly to you. What is that? That's the fellowship of the Spirit. But see, if it can happen in here, boy, what's the point of the church? So that we take what's in here, out there, and bring those that don't know Him back in here. Right here is where we come to worship and praise Him. Right, we've already said, house of God's a house of praise. But see, He says, as long as there's fellowship of the Spirit, there's still a purpose for the church. Right, as long as, 
Okay, any consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, bowels and mercies. How do we have the tools to win the world if verse number one stopped existing? Granted, all of them are things that God has given to us, but He gave them to us to go. He said, after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. But the Holy Ghost was the only thing missing when Jesus went that kept the church from being able to witness as God wanted them to witness. So he says, as long as these things exist, you can still witness to people. And as long as we can witness to people, there's still a purpose for the church. Because if there wasn't a purpose for the church, he'd have taken the church out of here a long time ago. The only reason that he hadn't come back is because there are still some that just through faith, obedience, and love of God come together and assemble saying, Lord, your son's name be high and lifted up. And Lord, we're going to go do our best, tell others about him, so that the Spirit can, with cords of loving kindness, draw them so that they can be saved and receive your son. But see, that fellowship of the Spirit, I said, verse number one, those are things that happen outside of here. When we come in here, if we've been in fellowship with the Spirit throughout the week, He's liable to show up once we get here. Why? Because we've been if everybody had been talking to Him all throughout the week, in order to have communication, if I regard iniquity in my heart, He won't hear my prayers. Well, I've got news for you. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the only thing you're going to hear from Him is things that convict, or that word just means convince. Things that convince you what you've done is wrong so that you'll repent of it. Conviction is not fellowship. Yet you do not have fellowship with the police officer that pulls you over because you were speeding. He pulls you over so that you'll stop being a threat to other people. He tells you what you did wrong, and then he says, drive safe. And then he leaves. There's no chit-chat. There's no shaking hands. There's no, hey, how you doing? It's a, you're in trouble. Don't move or you're liable to get tased. Right? Hands on the steering wheel. Don't make any sudden movements. That's not fellowship. But there's so many people think that that's what being a Christian is about, that God just hovers over you all the time ready to smite you. No. He desires fellowship of the Spirit for us. That's what the Lord said with the time we got left. We're going to teach on fellowshipping with the Spirit. Okay, keep in mind, John chapter number 16. Don't have time to go over there and read it. But Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going to go away for a time. And then for a time, you'll be without me. But then, you know, a little time later, we're going to be together for all of eternity. They missed the entire point of it. Because all they heard is, I'm going away. And they started freaking out. Right after he tells them, a little time and you shall not see me. Right? He says, but the Spirit of Truth, again, capital S, Spirit of Truth, shall come and lead and guide you into all truth. Okay, the Spirit was given not as a tool. Right? Thankfully, the Spirit does seal our soul when we got saved. I don't know the operation that God had to do to cut away my soul from what I am and then seal it with the Holy Ghost, but He did it in an instant. And when he did it, the Holy Ghost indwelled me. I became, as you know, the New Testament teaches us, I became his tabernacle, his temporary dwelling. Right? It's sitting permanent, but one of these days I'm going to get a body like his. And he won't need to take up residence inside anymore because I'll have fellowship with him in person forevermore. Amen. Not just a tool. Right? He's not a compass that tells us which way to go. Now he was called the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth. Throughout the New Testament, you'll find him referred to as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Love. It's got a whole lot of names, just like Jesus has a whole lot of names, and just like God in the Bible has a whole lot of names. Why does he have to have so many names? Because we can't figure out what he does unless he tells us what he does. Okay, he said, I'm not going to leave it up to you. I'm going to tell you who I am. Why? So that we would have the faith 
to believe that he would do those things. Well, the fellowship of the Spirit is not just embracing the Spirit as the one that convicts us, the one that seals us, the one that makes us a little happy every now and then, Brother Phil, hop up, shout. But that's not all that he is. He is our companion. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's the one that knows you better than you know yourself so that you don't have to experience the hardship that the world would have you to experience. The world wants your destruction. And through our companion, we can occasionally, if we're smart enough to listen to him, see some red flags and obey his voice and avoid it. Or in the midst of hardship, when we want to give up, he's the voice of encouragement. Right? Even though Jesus talked about that one day the Comforter was going to come, that, you know, when he got baptized, right, the Holy Ghost showed up. Right? He was there the whole time. Christ alluded to that when he went away, Spirit was going to come. But see, when people get saved, they don't know all those promises. They thought that they just weren't going to go, but they got something a whole lot better. They got God Himself dwelling inside of them. In fact, the New Testament says that's the great mystery. Why would God take himself, something very precious, and hide it in earthen vessels? Because all we are is dirt. But yet he loved that dirt so much that he wanted to be a part of that dirt so that that dirt could be turned into something precious and beautiful and be just like his son. You say, who does that, Holy Ghost? Who keeps us so that... Jesus Christ can present the bride blameless before the Father, Holy Ghost. Who's the one that puts up with our selfishness, our arrogance, our ignorance, right? our bullheadedness, or sometimes our irrational ability, or our irration, what's the word I'm looking for here? Irrationality. I think that might be a word. But, who puts up with all the things that we do that actually grieve God the Father and instead of judgment through love tries to show us that we were wrong so that we can be in fellowship with God? Holy Spirit. Right? You ever try to explain to a three-year-old how it's not the end of a world because something broke that they were playing with? That's what the Holy Ghost said. He has to wink at our ignorance so often. Because we can't see things the way that God sees things. And our faith is so little that we can't comprehend that God's got it all figured out. And He's just trying to console us to understand it's all going to be okay. But see, the thing about fellowship of the Spirit is that you've got to be willing to fellowship to experience fellowship. He will lead and guide us into all truth. But you know what it takes in order to lead and to guide? People got to follow. You can be a guide all you want to to a national park, but if nobody signs up, you're not a guide that day. You're going to have to find something else to do because there's nobody to guide. It takes commitment. It takes effort on our part in order for Him to fulfill the will of God, His own will, if you want to think about it, but what's that take? We've got to be all in. In order to fellowship, you have to determine that I'm actively going to fellowship through the Spirit with God the Father. Because it takes effort. I just don't answer out loud. But think, how often throughout the day do you stop and think in the course of your life? Right? Right? I thought about it when that old lady stopped in the roundabout. You know what I actually thought, Brother Mike? I said, oh, no, if this, I said, I, I guarantee you this is going to be the people that Brother Mike invited to the church from the hotel. And then they're going to say, who in the world just talked at me? And then, and then I would say, that was my first thought. And then I saw that there was only one person in the car, and he said people, and I said, now nah, I'm pretty sure that's not them. I said, ah, that would be a bad first impression. 
But what is, how often do we stop and think, is this what God would be happy with? Well, i got good news for you. You don't have to wonder about it. You can talk to him, and he'll tell you. You can have fellowship. Right, so think about all the times that we don't stop and think, well, is this what God would want? And then stop and think about all the times that we could be in fellowship with the Spirit and we're not. He says, as long as that still exists, you can be an effective Christian. What's that imply? Without it, you're not living the life that God wants you to live. You're missing something. Not because He didn't make it available, but because we don't take advantage of it. Right? The whole armor of God is still just as effective today as it was when the Apostle Paul wrote it down to the Ephesians. But what makes it ineffective if you don't put it on? Well, how can you fellowship with somebody if they don't want nothing to do with you? He's always willing. In fact, God craves for us to fellowship. But why? Because through fellowship, my spirit gets closer to His spirit. Right? Inwardly, I become more like His Son, which then I will yield so that outwardly He can make me more like His Son. Why do you think that the Christians at Antioch were first called Christians at Antioch? Because they just got a hold of fellowshipping with God. Granted, they didn't have this. They didn't have the full instruction of God. So how could they be Christ-like if they didn't have what we did? Because they got the same Spirit. Same Spirit that pinned down the rest of your Bible instructed them on what they should be. Right? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. Be Christ-like. What do you got to be? Christ-like. How do we do that? Fellowship with Christ. Just like hanging around the world rubs off on you, you hang around Christ, He's going to make a difference on you. But the whole, it takes effort. Okay, first off, there's places that you can fellowship. You cannot fellowship in the middle of a busy intersection in New York City. Okay, if you were standing there with another person in the middle of the intersection, you're not having fellowship there. You're dodging and ducking and trying to stay out of the way. Even if you were talking, you're trying to yell at each other so that you can hear each other over all the honking taxis. Right? And all the angry New Yorkers that are angry that you're in the intersection, just like that lady was that I got angry at. Okay? But what's the point? There are places that are suitable for fellowship and there are places that are not suitable for fellowship. Now, fortunately, He's inside us. Okay? But if we position ourselves in a place that it's not suitable for fellowship, we're not going to have fellowship. Okay, now, because it's inward, not dependent on what's going on around us. Although I promise you, if you're out in the middle of worldly sin, you're not going to fellowship. What you do outwardly does have an impact, but the world cannot impact your fellowship. That's what I'm trying to say here. Unless you let the world impact your fellowship, nothing outward can overtake the one that's inside of us. We could be in the middle of the most chaotic you know, mess in our life outwardly, but if inwardly we're prepared to fellowship, we can fellowship no matter where we are. Apostle Paul said that he went down to the bottom of a ship in the middle of the worst storm that he had ever seen. Sun hadn't shined in two weeks. Right? It's just tossing and turning. They've chucked everything off of the boat so that water can't get into the boat and start sinking. And he says, he went down there and he started praying in the middle of all that. And guess what? He said Jesus showed up. Told him everything's going to be okay. They're going to lose the ship, but nobody's going to die as long as they don't jump off the boat. What are you saying? In the midst of outwardly something that was very tumultuous, inwardly he still had fellowship. But it's not about what's going on out here. It's about what's going on in here. There are places that are suitable for fellowship. You've got to be able to put things aside. Right? It may be the case that if there's something in your heart that's in the way, you've got to be willing to let him move that out of the way. But you've got to be positioned in order to fellowship. You've got to be able to shut off the cares of this life. 
You've got to be willing through faith to just say, Lord, I know that I'm anxious. I know that I'm worried about this. I know that I'm upset. I know that all of this is going on, but right now I care more about fellowship with you than I do about all them other things. Right? When you're praying, rubber really doesn't meet the road until you finally just stop thinking about everything that you're thinking about and then get down to brass tacks of talking to God. Right? Just like when you're praying, you've got to shut it off. When it comes to fellowship and with the Spirit, you've got to learn to shut out. Why? Because then you're positioned to fellowship. Every now and then he winks at our ignorance and in the middle of our chaotic mess when we don't have a thought for God, something will come right back to our memory. A verse or something that the preacher said. Every now and then he'll do that. But imagine if you could do that all the time. Imagine if you had that fellowship and that clarity with the Spirit. You going to hear an audible voice? Nope, but he does a whole lot of talking. Is he going to tell you anything new? No, because there's nothing new under the sun. And he doesn't testify of himself, but he was, Jesus called him the Spirit of Truth. Who's he testify of? The Son. And he testifies of what he's seen of the Father. What's that? Everything that's recorded in here. The Holy Ghost will never tell you anything different than what's in the Bible. Because the Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. So that's one way to know whether or not what you... That thought that just popped in your head, whether it was you or whether it was the Holy Ghost. Because if it goes against this, nope. If you've got to justify how it's right with the Bible, Holy Ghost didn't tell you that. If you've got to, you know, well, I wonder if that's what it, you'll know. No doubt about it. Why? Because it lines up with this. Well, how do we have an understanding of this so that we know whether or not the thought that we just had is us or him? Well, Holy Ghost, Word is spiritually discerned. He's the one that will teach you what you need to know so that you know how to live. But there's fellowship in here, there's fellowship in here, and there's fellowship in here. All three. There are times when you just need to cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. You're an emotional mess, but how do you do that? That's fellowship of the heart. You've got to cast your emotions onto Him because He cares for you. Then there's fellowship in the Word. This is where God speaks to us. Holy Ghost just brings this back to our remembrance because that's what we need to remember in that situation. But if we hide it in our heart, He'll have something to remind us of. But He cannot remind you of something you do not know. Well, when we get in here, when the page just starts coming alive, and all of a sudden you're reading this verse, but then something in your head ticks, and you remember all the other verses that you've read that have to do with the verse that you're reading, who do you think does that? Right When you sit down and you read something that to the flesh doesn't make sense, but all of a sudden a light turns on and you understand the spiritual implication of it, who do you think does that? That's fellowship with the Spirit, but that's us yielding to instruction. Right In our hearts, that's yielding our cares, right, giving away what we care about to embrace what God would have us to care about. Lord, I care about this a whole lot, but I also know that you care about it. And you care about it more than I care about it. So I'll entrust it to you so that I can care about the things that I can make a difference in. How do you think that happens? Well, the Spirit of God convinces you through fellowship that God can handle it better than you can. He reminds you of all the stories that you've read throughout the Bible or all the times somebody stood up and testified in church on how God intervened on their behalf because He cared. And then he'll remind you of that verse that God's no respecter of persons. How's that, how's that happen? Fellowship. Because you've got to sit down and say, Lord, I either need or Lord, I don't understand. And because he loves you, he sits down and says, okay, what do you want to know? What's bothering you? Because if it bothers you, I care about it. Right, that still small voice in the midst of all of your crazy life, that's the Holy Spirit. 
But you've got to be listening in order to hear it. You've got to be positioned. But then you've got to be prepared. We already hinted at this. You've got to be in the right spot, but then you also got to be in the right mindset. I do not fellowship with the Spirit just so that I can boast that I've been in fellowship with the Spirit all week. No, because if that's what you wanted, you haven't been fellowshipping with the Spirit all week. Because if you had been fellowshipping with the Spirit all week, He'd have removed that desire out of your heart and replaced it with one that was actually godly. You've got to be prepared to commune with the very God of glory. What's that? Reverence. Respect. He owes us nothing, but because He loves us, He wants us to understand so that we can go and be a better witness for Him. He wants us to be equipped with those nuggets of truth from the Word of God so that when we go out, we have ammunition to stand against all that the world can throw against us. He doesn't ask us to fight, he just asks us to stand. Well, how do we stand? We've got to have fuel in the tank. Well, where do we get that fuel, Holy Ghost? Right, we come in not with the mindset of judgment or skepticism, but through faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Now, I've got news for you. The things that do line up with this Bible that the Holy Ghost may give to you, because God said that if any man want to know the will of God for his life, all he's got to do is ask and then listen for the answer. There are things that God may ask you to do sometimes that don't make sense. In fact, there's a lot of times that the Spirit's going to ask you to do things that don't make sense. It's okay. That's normal. You know why that's normal? God uses the base things to confound the wise. If we could figure out how to do it, then that means the world could figure out how it happened. And if the world could explain it, they would explain away God. God asks us to do things that don't make sense to us so that our faith can be rewarded, one. Two, we'll be where God wants us to be. But then three, when God does it, God gets all the credit for it. It may not make sense to your flesh, but it'll make sense in this. Because what's in this is contrary to what's in me, that new man. I mean, it's not contrary to what's in me. What's in me, the new man, is contrary to the old man. This speaks to the new man, not the flesh. You've got to be mentally prepared to reign in your flesh before you can have fellowship with the Spirit. Otherwise, you'll be divided. The house divided cannot stand. You cannot serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. But when you embrace that position that He gave you as a king to rule and reign over this flesh, when you rein it in and say, we're going to listen to the Holy Ghost and do what the Holy Ghost says, then you're going to have fellowship. Because God will speak all He wants to, but in the last days there will be a famine for not the presence of God, not the love of God. All of them things in verse number 1 that we talked about, there's no shortage of them. God still got a full supply. What's the shortage of? The hearing, the application, the using of the things of God. You could sit down and try to fellowship, but if you're blocking out everything the other person says, you're not fellowshipping. But not only do you have to be positioned, prepared, right? but then the final one, You've got to be persistent. Just because you fellowshiped this morning doesn't mean you're fellowshipping right now. But everything spiritually is apt to change just as quick as anything in the world. We're one thought away from losing fellowship. We're one action away from losing fellowship. But that's part of that preparedness. We've got to get everything out of our life, repent of it, so that we can't have fellowship with Him. Well, the persistence is saying, Lord, I know I'm still going to mess up. Why? Because I'm human. I still got to deal with this flesh. My heart's deceitfully. I can't even know it. I don't know what I'm capable of, Lord. 
But by your grace, when I do mess up, I'll get it made right as soon as I know about it. But I mean, even the Apostle Paul said there were days that he did do what he wouldn't do, and there were days the things that he would do, he didn't do. But that's saying he had to wrestle with the flesh, you're going to have to wrestle with the flesh. And there's going to be days that the flesh wins for a moment until you nail it back down to that cross that we took up and followed after Christ with. So what that cross is for, by the way, to keep the old man dead on it. I can't leave it behind because it's a part of me. I've got to take it with me, but I can keep it stuck to that thing. Right? I died out to sin with Christ and was raised in newness of life. Well, part of that newness of life is I have to safeguard it. Right? I don't want to taint the righteousness of God that he's robed me in with myself. Because if I do, Father looks at me, he doesn't see that robe of righteousness anymore. He sees the open sin in my life. He sees the hidden sin in my life. He sees the iniquity or the unequal dealing that I've given God, and he can't see that robe of righteousness because I'm in the way. But if you've got any of those things in your life, you're not prepared to fellowship. Because what your life says is that you don't care about fellowshipping with God. Then although God desires fellowship, He will not offer fellowship if we aren't ready and prepared to fellowship. But then there's also the aspect of pray without ceasing. Really, praying without ceasing means that you're always talking to God. What's that? Fellowship with the Spirit. All the time. You've got to be persistent. Because habits, right, are easy to keep doing. If you habitually talk to the Lord, right, it's going to be weird not to talk to the Lord. But the moment that you stop, whether it's for a minute, whether it's for an hour, whether it's for a day, when you stop, stopping becomes easier because it's a habit. The inward man, it's natural to want to talk to God. You've got to get your flesh into a habit of not wanting to talk to God to keep the Spirit from talking to God. The inward man desires and craves that connection. But what stops it? We develop a habit in the flesh rather than a habit in the Spirit. But persistency. All that is is it worked yesterday, it's going to work today. He may ask me to do something different today than I did yesterday, but the plan is very simple. What's that? He purchased me, redeemed me from sin, knew I couldn't keep myself saved, so He sealed me with the Spirit, and He intended the Spirit to lead and guide me so that I wouldn't be left to my own devices to figure out what God said, but that He outlined it all right here. And if I'm faithful to say, Lord, teach me, He'll instruct me. And if I'm faithful to apply it to my heart, the Spirit can use it to lead and guide me. Even though this may not be handy, it'll be recorded here. Even though somebody may ask me outside of church, well, what's this mean? He'll bring to my remembrance that time that the preacher preached just on that. Or he'll bring to my remembrance the verse that I need in my deepest, darkest moment because I learned it and out of his appreciation that I cared about what he said more than what I said, he'll bring to my remembrance that thing in fellowship and remind me that it's just as true today as when it was pinned down. That it's just as powerful today as it was when it worked in the Scriptures. Why? Because he changes not. And you say, well, it doesn't always you know, make sense. We've talked about that to the flesh. Well, no, because God's ways are above our ways. I can't explain to you how something inside of you can be louder than what's going on in your life. But trust me, it can. Because right now, all you can see is what's going on out here. And you're not looking inward to the one that's in control of everything that's happening out here. There's nothing inside of me worth any value other than God. 
So why would I look at anything out there? Why would I look at anything about me to try and figure out what's going on in my life? I'd rather just have fellowship with him. Because the closer I am to him, how do you think David, I'll end on this, how do you think David could say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life? Because he knows that goodness and mercy hang around God, and if there's nothing between me and God, goodness and mercy got to be behind me. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.